Hello everybody, Wolfpack here, and in today's video, we will be doing something new and exciting. Today, I will be interviewing Admiral from Dry Dog Dreams Games, which is the studio currently behind the upcoming game Task Force Admiral. Of course, this is my first time doing anything like this on the channel, and I thought it went rather smoothly overall, and I hope you all enjoyed it as well. I want to mention that we did this with the stage feature in Discord over on my Discord, so if you want to get in on future interviews and possibly have your questions asked, go hop onto the Wolfpack Discord. There will be a link down below. Additionally, I wanted to thank Admiral for coming on and uh, allowing me to interview him. Anyway, I hope you all enjoy the interview. So just kicking off with the first question, what is Task Force Admiral? If you could give a quick elevator pitch and what it's inspired by. In addition to that, what inspired you to begin working on Task Force Admiral now? Well, uh, thank you for having us. So if I was to describe Task Force Admiral, uh, I would say it's, uh, it's Carriers at War. So, you know, the old uh, SSG game from the late 80s, early 90s, uh, mixed with fighting still, the old, the old again, uh, uh, tactical naval combat 3D game of 1999. If I, I'm not, um, if not, if I'm not wrong, uh, with a lot of inspiration indeed of titles like uh, Task Force 1942. Uh, perhaps also to some extent, uh, although I went to it very late in my life. Uh, great naval battles. Mm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there, there was that thing back in the day uh, that was a bit of a frustration, even though I was 10 years old, is that uh, all these games, you know, they only explore usually one side of the naval, uh, naval combat dimension, uh, for all the best reasons, of course, but other, uh, game designers always have found a very hard to keep together within the same uh, game instance uh, what I would call surface warfare, and on the other hand, uh, carrier warfare. I mean, if you see carrier at war, uh, carriers at war, it's from uh, it's uh, you know it's a carrier game, but uh, a surface combat has to be resolved in a different way. Uh, if you see now, Task Force 1942, they actually completely take away any reference to. Uh, to naval aviation. I mean, you don't even have planes. You, know, you only have them uh, on the map as little dots. And then you go to Fighting Steel in 1999. You would think that by, uh, by then they would have found a way to make them coexist. And uh, they still haven't. I mean, Fighting Steel, even though it's, uh, it's you know, it's the successor to Great Naval Battle, where battles, which one, was one of these games which managed at its level to have both carriers and surface combat uh, coexist. Well, fighting steel is just about surface combat. You don't get airplanes, you don't get submarines. So it's been some sort of a frustration from early on. And I was telling myself, I mean, what was the issue there? I mean, what was the reason why we couldn't have uh, our cake and eat it? And... Uh, Slowly, I started to devise in my head some crazy plans as I grew up. And, uh, you know, at some point, that was for the technical aspect. I mean, I have always been frustrated by that, um, by that technical limitation. And I, uh, and I felt like I needed to find a solution to this limitation. I mean, someday when I got rich or something, which I haven't just yet. But, uh, I mean, that was back in the day. Uh, that was on one side. On the other side, there, I had some sort of revelation at the end of the first decade of this century when I started to read actual books, you know, about these battles. Because when you're small, I mean, you, you rely on games manuals, when we had games manuals, that is. And then uh, you start to read about all the stuff, but this kind of stuff, generalist, uh, generalist, I mean, how you call it? Uh, in English, I mean, it's, you know, it's for the larger public, right. the larger audience. Right. Like a general audience. Yeah, for a general audience that tend to be, uh, it's not dumbed down, but I mean, it's for everybody to, it's it's Martin Kaidin, it's that star, uh, that kind of stuff. You read that, it's really easy to read and you, you have all, a, a lot of stories in your head. But uh, then you realize that most of these stories 
uh, they tend to be uh, I mean it's they, they've been romance a bit yeah. I mean, uh, some of them are actually just uh, urban legends being retold and then you come across I would say I mean the first your first real book in my case that would have been shattered sword by um, uh, partial and Tully mm-hmm. that you probably have read. Yeah, highly recommend. Highly recommend, of course. And uh, that's a that's a book about uh, the the Battle of Midway scene from the Japanese side, uh, but with a lot of myth busting involved. And uh, you start to read that, and then you go on and you start to read uh, people like uh, John Lundstrom. I don't know if you had the opportunity to read Lundstrom. Uh, he was the author of. Uh, he is. He is. Uh, thankfully, he's still with us. I mean, he's. Uh, he's the author of the first team, which is a, uh, which is a book about the life and the glory and the death of all those who were fighter pilots in the U.S. Navy during the first year of the war. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have. Uh, and then uh, John Lundstrom at uh, at some point it was it was perhaps in 2011 perhaps he wrote a book that was. Um, there was Black Shoe Carrier Admiral, which is a biography of Admiral Fletcher. I would say a battle biography of Admiral Fletcher because it's it's mostly about uh, what he did during the war, and um, especially during the first year. And to me, it was some sort. It was a double illumination. First, that was that time when I got Shattered Sword, and I realized that. Sometimes battles they they would uh, hang, uh, they would be hanging by a thread and by when I say a thread I mean a really really uh, uh, just a little point detail that could actually completely derail a battle and this is what Midway is about I mean yeah. you have little micro events uh, micro uh, small decisions that take uh, unbelievable that have unbelievable uh consequences i mean there's a carrier combat uh you you realize reading a book like that realize you realize that it's the uh, it has that sort of um, uh granular uh, gra- uh sorry granularity that you wouldn't find in any other theater i mean we're talking about the fate of a theater and i say a larger theater like the pacific theater of operations uh being decided by one guy dropping one bomb on one ship, uh, I mean, you you have nothing like that, you know, on the Eastern Front or during the Battle of Britain. I mean, right. uh, okay, I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah, there is so much fuel for you know uh, game induced drama in there. I mean, it's the a fantastic material, and uh, yeah, and it awoke within me the realization that it works the same you know for surface combat too because when you read uh stuff like uh the late jim horns fisher's uh, neptune's inferno for instance and then uh, you would see that uh during a, a given battle just waiting an extra five minutes decided the fate of a thousand of two thousand people or maybe decided uh, what would become of Henderson Field that evening. Sometimes just waiting for uh, just just an extra minutes taking a decision based on the report you hear uh, you heard about uh, about a radar contact, and you wouldn't believe what your radar operator tells you and stuff like that. I mean, it's the the potential for gameplay, if I may say, uh, felt mesmerizing. Going back to John Lundstrom and Black Shoe Carrier Admiral, I had some personal sympathy for Admiral Fletcher for a long time because uh, it just so happened that he was uh, a hero in uh, the very early um, comic, uh, fr- uh, French comic, French Belgian comic na- uh, named Bug Danny. I mean, you might have heard of Bug Danny. He's, it's a series about a, an American naval aviation pilot. Except he's U.S. Air Force, but he's detached in the uh, in the Navy. For, uh, and uh, uh, the first volumes, you know, they are not very well researched. I mean, that was the fifties and all that. It was very like pulp content. But uh, you, that was my first uh, encounter with Admiral Fletcher. And then 
uh, yeah, for years I wondered, I mean, why I don't have, I, I just don't have stuff about him. I don't understand why he's, he's, uh, there's so little coverage of his life and his operation, even though the man was in command uh, on, on during three of the four carrier battles of 1942. And then this book comes in and then you realize that uh, besides the drama of battle, mm -hmm. I mean, there's all the drama that leads to the battle and everything that follows after that. I mean, the, uh, everything the that politics. comes... politics. <laughs> your politics, your reputation, but also before your, the battle, the fact that you are, in, you are in a personal situation that is decided by this politics that might, you know, create stakes that uh, go way beyond the, just the tactical stakes of mm -hmm. the battle itself. Yeah. And, you're, and also, finally, you realize that all these battles were such a mess that has never been covered before by any any game whatsoever in terms of communication, uh, naval search, uh, intelligence or lack thereof, even even code on the battlefield, stuff like that. I mean, you never see it. So I decided. I mean, it's time. I'm gonna sell my house. I mean, uh, one of my. Uh, I had bought an apartment, and I told myself, okay. I mean, it got. It got some value. I'm gonna sell it, and I'm gonna use the money to make a game. So uh, there we went. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. I guess that led to multiple other questions I could ask. But the the fog of war aspect that you're really trying to display with Task Force Admiral is one of the more fascinating aspects to me. And you mentioning, I guess, midway leads to a good question i think of just how open these scenarios will be because uh correct me if i'm wrong but task force admiral will be mostly scenario or like mission based so you play through like the battle of midway for example or uh, various other scenarios it's not going to be like um, a grand campaign or well yeah, we we have some <clears throat> uh, projects for uh, for the future of course <clears throat> but right now the the objective is to ship uh, volume one with uh, several scenarios, but these scenarios are grouped within, I would call them operations. Mm -hmm. I mean, like midway in itself, I mean, it wouldn't be just, you know, uh, one midway scenario and you're done with it. And it wouldn't be just also one midway variant and you'll be done with it. It's more like you have a, a, a midway folder with four, five, six, maybe different uh, variations. That would be, you know, hard variations, which means that uh, the conditions for uh, for these scenarios will be dramatically changed from what happened history uh, historically. I mean, there are there are a lot of scenarios that we can think of. For instance, uh, the the intelligence not uh, not being able to predict the Japanese attack, which means that you would go uh, you would go over there with the Japanese plan being in full in full force. Or you would have a situation with them, um, uh, with Carrier Division Five uh, joining the Kido Butai because Coral Sea wouldn't happen. But then it means that you would have Lexington too. Uh, or you could also imagine that uh, Operation A uh, AL doesn't happen, so mm -hmm. it means that uh, Akuta and uh, the Northern Force they all join with the main effort. I Many there are this I would say are um, you would call it hard written modification and then you get everything that is soft written uh i would say that uh, i we want to offer uh the player um a large array of possibilities uh we're still working on that with jb our dev to see to which extent we can emulate the system that carriers at war has that means that if the player chooses not to have the uh, given original scenario, which would, for instance, the very original, uh, the, the the historical midway, then you can still uh, ask to be given some randomness to it. I mean, having an extra uh, an extra carrier being uh, joining the force or stuff like that, if you really want to be surprised. But uh, you also realize that there are a few options out there, which wouldn't be available to previous games because of their again their lack of granularity that we're, there's a reason why we go the simulation way in this and by simulation way i means that 
um, uh, that uh, that car uh, that uh, Task Force Admiral is still a war game, but the world is simulated. I mean, like Gravity is a war game, but the world is simulated. You've got physics, you've got ballistics. Uh, even combat mission is like that. You see what I mean? I mean, it's not, these are not counters with um, with uh, combat ratios or with di- dice rolling. This is a simulator. Maybe it's not as advanced as, say, uh, EO2 grid battles would be in terms of p- plain physics or stuff like that, but it's still thought so as to put a maximum of elements in there to recreate uh, the conditions of the battle itself. And what it means is that, for instance, wind will have an importance that you wouldn't have in a classical in a classical carrier, uh, carrier game. It just so happens that Midway took place the way it took place because of the, uh, among all the factors, of course, because of the, the direction of the wind. Right. Uh, if the wind had been in another direction, then the battle would be completely different. And uh, the fact that uh, we can offer the play, uh, we will be offering the player the possibility to use, I would say, historical weather or have the weather completely randomized. And I can tell you, even though some people wouldn't believe it, it totally changes the experience. No, oh, yeah, and that that was you've answered, uh, you know, half my questions with just that. Like, uh, just having different weather patterns definitely would affect gameplay in a carrier game or any naval game, really. Um, additionally, I think a lot of people when they hear that uh, Task Force Admiral Volume One will be scenario based, they're worried there won't be that much like replayability or variety in the missions i think a lot of people think of like okay i guess my example is silent hunter 2 where the campaign was just a strict list of missions that you played through um and it wasn't super replayable but with this it sounds like there's going to be plenty of opportunity for variety like you can play we keep going to midway but you can play midway like you know multiple times and each time it would be completely different so um, I think that's probably reassuring for a lot of people. And like you said, you have future plans and everything as well. But, um, oh, yeah, that sounds great to me. But I can address this um, this worry. And thank you again for your kindness in that regard. But, uh, I, yeah, I can understand people who are being a bit taken aback by the idea that there wouldn't be a campaign to start uh, to begin with. But I think there are certain things that need to be Re, uh, that uh, they need to be reminded of uh, so as to not to be too harsh in regard of our design decisions. One of them is the fact that we are a very, very small team. I mean, it's the, the, the core team, even though fortunately we had a lot of people helping since then, but the core team itself is made of four people. Out of these four people, only one is a developer. I mean, I'm just the man who is speaking, and then we have uh, our 3D artist and our 2D artist, and all together, that's four people. I mean, there's so much. You, uh, there's only so much you can achieve with that kind of team. If somebody goes on Moby Games and check out the uh, the teams that made that delivered games like Task Force 1942, Great Naval Battles, or even Fighting Steel, or even uh, John Tiller's game. You're going to see, I mean, there's going to be 15 of them, 20 of them, not to mention all the people working with them at the publisher level. Um, <laughs> all of this has a cost. I mean, not just money in terms of time, in terms of family time. Uh, so, I mean, the, the reason why we haven't been promising a campaign from day one is because we want to be realistic. And you don't want, we don't want to shit talk our audience. I mean, I, I could start to promise you stuff that will never be, we will never be able to deliver uh, within a lifetime uh, and people would be excited. But I don't want people to be excited for the wrong reasons. So that's one point. Uh, second point about, uh, I see people, you know, talking about sandboxes. Uh, it's not about criticizing uh, the players perspective of what a sandbox is, but uh, I mean, it's really a bit irrelevant in regard of what Carrier Combat was 
especially in 1942. I mean, it was it wasn't a kind of uh, a, a carrier task force. It's not a submarine on patrol. It's not a, a submarine that you. Uh, it's not a force that you send to a quadrant and you tell them, okay, you you sail around and if you find something, you kill it. I mean, uh, if you if you don't find anything, you just raid a base or something like that. No, I mean, carrier task force. They are how you say they are like ninjas, if I may say. I mean, sure. they are they are, they are, they are being assigned a target. Uh, they yeah. are not over somewhere loitering. Uh, they would loiter in certain time at certain times in during the war, but. Uh, especially of the Solomons or just before the Coral Sea, but this is not the. It's, they are not. They would be waiting for an opportunity to strike. Uh, they were. It's like you know waiting in a harbor, except they didn't have. Uh, uh, they just wanted to be ready to strike at a moment notice, but they wouldn't be there freely patrolling the area, killing subs all or, uh, or or convoys or stuff like that. I mean. Uh, yeah, they went out work. with a specific purpose. Sometimes, of course, they would be cruising, waiting for orders, but they would still be waiting for orders. I mean, I can understand that a uh, submarine gameplay would still work for, for instance, German raiders. I mean, I've got people making remarks about that. And that yes, indeed, you can have a graph a graph a simulator that works like a submarine game, but uh, cars they don't work like that. Or at least you could have gameplay about that, but it wouldn't be history. Historical, and this is another point I want to make. I mean, we are committed to our uh, historical recreation. I mean, uh, the importance of history in our design, and uh, we want to stick to it. So even though I'm quite sure that there are many ways uh, to use our engine to do something else, uh, especially a battle a, a, a battle stations type of game, or uh, a carrier survival kind of game, uh, and this is not what we're heading for right now. Uh, even though mm, all, all the bets are off for the future, in the meantime, we have to focus on a very given, uh, on a, I wouldn't say restricted, I mean, I would say well-defined objective. And uh, it cannot check all the boxes. That's also the reason why we're not having playable, Jap uh, playable Japanese faction for the first, for our first try, for our first game. Because... There is like no way in hell right now uh, I'd be able with the means I have, with the team I have, with the time and the money we have to simulate the Japanese side at the same level of authenticity and fidelity uh, comparable to the one we will have for the US Navy. I mean, I've been spending hours and hours, hundreds of hours, maybe even already by now thousands of hours scoring American uh, uh, I mean, searching for American archives. I mean, there's uh, there's really a lot of them. I mean, that's the that's the good thing about World War Two in 2022 is that everything is declassified. But mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot a lot of content to digest, and then you make so many discoveries of, along the way, and that kind of stuff. I mean, I I'm not a Japanese speaker. I'm not a I'm not a, I'm not Japanese myself, and from what I understand, even some some Japanese today would have hard time reading some of the contents of back of that uh, in that day. I mean, that's one of the problems that was encountered by Chazen over uh, two uh, great battles when he yeah. came to making a PTO uh, version of it. So uh, obviously, I mean, we're gonna we have a lot of Japanese supporters, and I'm sure that we're gonna make a fantastic volume two, which will be dedicated to uh, the IGN and the Kido Butai. But uh, everything. Uh, Good things take time. Yeah, and I think it's good that, I mean, you are setting realistic expectations. I feel like a lot of indie developers definitely uh, suffer from, I guess, scope creep would be the way to describe it. Just uh, promising all these various features and not being able to deliver and end up, you know, disappointing uh, their audience or making people upset whether those people deserve to be upset or not um i guess has the has the scope of task force admiral really changed that much since you uh got your publisher microprose i guess y'all that announcement was what uh over a year ago now years ago years yeah ago. wow okay 
2020. Yes, indeed, 2020. Yeah, I mean, well, it's uh, the fact that uh, I'm still out there talking about that and uh, not jobless or anything. I mean, uh, it shows how the, the kind of support we get from my, our publisher. I mean, no, the scope didn't change. They didn't force mm -hmm. us to do anything. And that was one of the conditions for uh, getting together with Micropros in the first place. I mean, we, uh, David, the, the CEO of Micropros, is someone very understanding in regard of our freedom of action and uh, our, uh, our rights as creators. So he never forced us to uh, to change the original setting. I mean, of course, before we got into an agreement, I mean, we would go over our plans for the future. I mean, that's that's very legit. I mean, he wants to know if we plan on uh, doing that and stopping and being done with it, or we want to expand the whole thing. I mean, obviously, we want to expand the whole thing. A TFA is being built as being... Uh, uh, always evolving. I mean, it's a thing that can be evolve. I call it vertically and horizontally. I mean, it means that we can horizontally it means that we can move to the ja uh, to the Japanese side. We can move to new areas. We can even move to Europe at some point. Vertically, I mean that we can actually uh, either go up, which means that at some point, hopefully, we we'll have a strategic layer. Uh, mm -hmm. Or we could also go down. I mean, at the station level, when you man your uh, your A gun, or uh, <laughs> or uh, when you actually play Task Force nineteen forty two. So sure. uh, that kind of all all of that. I mean, these are plans. I mean, they are still plans. But uh, I want to prove that we are able to actually uh, go further by first delivering a game that wouldn't be a dud. And I think that David and Micropos have been very supportive in that regard, and and many others, well, many others, and uh, they understand that we want first to make a good game, and then build on the kind of reputation we have acquired for ourselves uh, when and when time comes. Well, we will have something bigger, but we want it. To be also good, we don't want it to be. In French, we call it a usine à gaz. I don't know how you say it in English, but uh, you know, we don't want to have something so buggy that it would be uh, it would be impossible to expand it and to make it bigger uh, without making it worse. I guess having the ability to expand upwards and downwards is very good, and I guess gives insight into some of the future plans you have for Task Force Admiral, like the Japanese faction, for example, um, is, mul I guess I have to ask, is multiplayer something you are even considering uh, for the future of Task Force Admiral? That has been a hot question, so. Ah, uh, yeah, I know that you have a gun on your head right now, and <laughs> you cannot talk really, but uh, I mean, yeah, and I mean, uh, multiplayer, but uh, multiplayer has always been a second tier uh development uh mainly because first uh i mean i again i can understand i mean it's the same kind of thing as when i see uh, our gentle fans uh talking about uh having small people on the flight deck so i mean they've been used uh to nice things uh by other products i mean i'll take the example of you know um total war all right they're gonna tell you uh, I mean, you you have the uh, illustration that animating soldiers is not a problem, and you have the uh, illustration that you can get multiplayer. So I mean, why don't you? I mean, I, I mean, it's right. not that I don't want to. I mean, it's uh, first of all, I mean, at least the little guys doesn't have any gameplay implications, but that also because it doesn't have gameplay implications that uh, we're gonna keep it for the very end. I mean, for, I'm gonna have. A game, wor a working game first before I end up adding little moving guys because people don't understand sometimes that it's uh, uh, it's a lot of work. In your, uh, it takes an animator, it takes people to model the little guys, and then you have to put the path on the ships and stuff like that. I mean, it it, it it's not something. Uh, it's gonna eat uh, development time. So, I mean, maybe it's a good Kickstarter goal or something, but it's not going to be central in our development and multiplayer. That's another kind of problem. Multiplayer. I mean, um, it has to be central 
or it has not to be included because right. uh, it, it, the game has to be built uh, around it to some extent. Uh, I mean, there's uh, there's another. Uh, there are two other teams at Microprose right now working hard on uh, on games that are of our same genre, which are the tri- uh, Triassic team on Sea Power, and uh, should I even call it a team? It's Mikhail working on regiments. I mean, we're talking about two games which are, uh, I would say, RTS war games. Mm-hmm. And uh, and in both cases we didn't uh, and in all the three cases we didn't go for multiplayer. It's not that we hate multiplayer. I mean, uh, we got people telling us. I mean, why don't you do that multiplayer thing? I mean, is there... no, we don't hate you, people. It's just that uh, uh, in certain cases we only have two hands, one brain, and uh, twenty-four hours in a day and seven days in a week. And that uh, if we want to do multiplayer, we don't want it to be a gimmick, something that will be broken on a level where we'll be busy fixing bugs in single player so i mean that's uh, that's the obvious you know for a, a game like a game like Mihai's regiment but in our case you have the added difficulty that it's never been done before oh there's yeah no 3D, there's no 3d carrier game out there that offers multiplayer uh okay i mean uh, i'm not talking about world of warship but uh, again i mean i'd say that carriers are not really well, they are popular. They are not really popular over there uh, for all the, the reasons. But this is not the same kind of game. I mean, all, of course, today everybody's playing World of Warships or playing War Thunder. But uh, people have to understand also that these are multiplayer experience with some co-op or single-player content. But they are multiplayer experience first and foremost. In our case, we are single-player experience. We are laying the foundations for multiplayer. Uh, in volume one, I mean, I know it's not obvious, but uh, we we are developing a replay system and a save game system. The save game and the replay system are actually the first steps you take before developing multiplayer in a game like that, because it's using part of the technology you need for that. Yeah. But once you get there, even when you have the tech, I mean, uh, you uh, you you still need you know to make the gameplay. Um, Wolfie, you've been playing stuff like Harpoon or CMO for decades, probably by now. I mean, you you understand that some of them attempted multiplayer. It's just not easy to have a game which is real time, but spanning like two or three days of game time. Uh, being yeah. enjoyable for people who are for people in a multiplayer environment. I mean, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't. I mean, and I guess uh, like IL2, 1940, or Pacific Fighters had this issue too. Like, people don't really realize the distances involved with uh, carrier combat or naval combat in general and like how much downtime there really is. Um, yeah, that definitely would make multiplayer challenging. I will say hearing about the replay feature is um, (laughs) very exciting for me. Honestly, one of the most exciting features for me as someone who attempts to make his videos look cinematic. So (laughs) I'm excited about that. It was made for you. Oh, thank you. (laughs) No, 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 really. I mean, it was made for uh, YouTubers and streamers and all that. I mean, uh, I'm the kind of, I mean, we're making a good looking game. Agreed. Uh, if people, oh, thank you. And uh, if people cannot make sure they, to have the right angle when they want to record their video and uh, and stuff like that, I mean, it's uh, no, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not Cold Wars. I mean, Cold Wars, despite uh, the fact that uh, action is hectic, you are centered on your ship. And you might have two or three other ships, but even then you will not switch to the view of the other ship if you do not have, like, a weapon approaching or stuff like that. I mean, it's still manageable. Even in a submarine game, it's manageable in general. Oh, okay, so, uh, sorry, Cold Warriors is a submarine game. It's just that I was thinking about your last video, and I forgot that it's a submarine game. <laughs> yeah, that's game. fair. <laughs> Modders have uh, uh, gone crazy, which leads to another question, too. Yeah, of course. But I mean, for simulators, uh, I would call them first-person simulators. 
just because you're on a single platform. I mean, it's okay. You can still manage that. But then in a in carrier uh, in a carrier game like uh, I mean in a game with carriers like, like Task Force Admiral. And uh, and I insist it's a game with carriers. It's not just a carrier game. I mean, we uh, we are making surface combat two and all that, but we'll come back to that later. Um, the there's the action happening over around your flagship, and then there's, there's the action happening over uh, over the enemy task force, and then it might ha usually you, their plane find you when your planes find them. I mean, you're not a octopus. I mean, there's no way in hell you can manage to cover all that. And beyond that, beyond the the fact that I wanted people to be able to catch the right sequence, what they needed for a screenshot or or a video, there's the fact that we are going for this uh, uh, fog of war thing. Uh, that means that if you play with the highest level of realism. Uh, you're gonna have a very <laughs> an experience very much centered around your flagship, but you're not gonna be allowed to see much more beyond the horizon. And uh, I think that people should be entitled to see the result of their actions later on during the after action report. Uh, otherwise, it's gonna get uh, very frustrating. I mean, to have all these good graphics and not be able to enjoy them at all. Yeah, the just the the prospect of making these video just videos on this game is very exciting to me. Just like cuz I you know, with the higher difficulty settings, you ha you could have no idea what's actually going on. Yeah. <laughs> and then you you know, you cut to seeing uh your surface ships getting slaughtered, which I think would be awesome. <laughs> but uh I do I do I am excited to actually play and honestly make videos on it. I I did the I guess you mentioned I have just naturally you mentioned uh we brought up modding. Um how Ooh. is modding support um is modding support something you have in mind from the game because I I am obviously a huge proponent of modding but uh I'd love well, to hear your thoughts. Well, obviously I mean modding in your case uh, I mean, uh, apart from uh, great, but uh, I mean, you you wouldn't be maybe showing Cold Warriors videos uh, still if it wasn't for Dot Mod. Well, I and, mean, uh, even going like Silent Hunter Three, like oh yeah, and Silent Hunter Three <laughs> and uh, War on the Sea. Yeah, I mean, uh, at some point, I mean, it uh, it cannot be ignored. I mean, especially in our case, I mean, we don't. It's hard enough to find people to play your game. Uh, if you want to limit them in the way they want to play it, then uh, you're really shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to make, again, uh, fake promises. I mean, I want to be very specific about the words we use so that people understand what kind of uh, effect they can have on the game. Uh, Task Force Admiral is mod-friendly. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's mod supported. I mean, it's not something that is made to be totally changeable. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, but at the same time, we were going, we are going to provide a lot of tools that we're using for ourselves uh, to integrate new ships, to uh, to make new scenarios, and to change the liveries, yeah. uh, the skins. Stuff like that. I mean, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna at least for the airplane and the ships, it's gonna be as moddable than, I'd say, uh, a, a game like Il Two, the old Il Two, has become by uh, by oh, now. Okay. I mean, it's not uh, except that Il Two really wasn't mod friendly at the beginning because Alieg he was he was not such a big fan of mods back then, if I remember. Right. But, uh, I mean, they, they had to crack it. But in our case, you don't need to crack it. We're going to show you how to change the stuff, add new ships and all that. Uh, just don't expect us to actually, you know... Uh, Open all of your that, like, source code up to people? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> well, uh, that's the point. Yeah, I mean, it's still going to be... Uh, I, Let's. I mean, it's named Volume One, and we're gonna go for Volume Two, Volume Three. I guess that it's gonna be part of your line of questioning afterwards. But uh, 
we, uh, I want to provide people with a good reason to upgrade to the next level. Absolutely. Uh, there are going to be gameplay, ver uh, gameplay mods and stuff like that, stuff that uh, modders are not expected to actually come up with because they will require a level of, of work and fidelity that you would not necessarily have at, uh, at your disposal as a modder. But myself... Uh, I have been modding on European Air War. I've been modding on uh, Tank Platoon 2. So I can understand that it's also a very important stepstone in the um, uh, in the personal uh, in your personal, I would say, uh, path right. to game development. I mean, you can see uh, you can see right now the C Power team uh, has people in their team that used to be modders on Cold Wars. I mean, this is super important to detect early talent uh, because these people, maybe for the next day game, like it's the case with uh, C Power, well, there will be people who know your way of working, who will be able to, prov to provide you with much help uh, and uh, have expertise and understand your way of design. Just saying that, that uh, I'm going to, for instance, I, I think we're going to, if we find a way to do it properly, we're going to activate a uh, workshop at a certain level for uh, workshop functions for Task Force Admiral, especially for sharing scenarios. And uh, as for the rest, I would say that I, I'm not a super fan again. I mean, sorry, guys who are listening to us and would be doing war on the, uh, are doing war on the sea modding. I'm not a super fan, you know, of my game getting better thanks to 3D models taken from uh, uh, Lestar or... Uh, or Gaijin, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I will not oppose it, but, uh, I mean, this is just not what I want for... Uh, the what I necessarily want for my game. Uh, but I will still give you all the tools you need for this to happen if it's your decision to do it for yourself. Um, fair. And yeah, I think that's all fair and, fair. I guess, reassuring, because, like I said, I, I do like modding. I think it does increase the replayability of games. Um, and, yeah. Sure, but uh, what I, what I, Wolfie, about that, and you make me think of it. I mean, my, my point about modding is that it shouldn't be the work of a modder to make To a fix game. a game. To fix a game, yes, yeah. that's the that's the point. I mean, I don't, I, I, I mean, I don't want to be. Uh, you can make a game better, but uh, if you actually need uh, to make it better to the point of fixing it, I think that uh, I have failed in my mission of making a game to begin with. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mean, I think that's generally a fair, fair outlook on that kind of situation for sure. Um, I guess, and that kind of so getting more into, I guess, more gameplay aspects and your recent uh video as of recording this interview you showed off some carrier operations um oh, yeah. which is on the on the channel and everyone thinks those look great i think it's something a lot of people are curious about is how surface combat will work and i guess what i was thinking if you're playing on the more realistic settings and you detach I don't know, a SAG or I, I don't know, the, you know, a surface action group and send them away. Well, is the AI capable of handling the tactical decisions involved with surface combat while you're on your flagship? Or like how much micromanaging is there with surface combat, I guess, uh, is something I'm curious about. Well, I don't want to betray a great secret of AI, but technically, if you can make an AI can, that can do it for your enemy, it sh should be able to do it for your allied ships too. I mean, that's the first point. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, what you can expect is to have uh, friendly ships behave the same way as enemy ships behave. So time will tell if we are able to provide a proper uh, artificial intelligence for surface combat. I mean, the proper, I mean, an acceptable and uh, gratifying uh, artificial intelligence for surface combat. I think it's been long overdue. I think there is like not a single game out there that has one. I mean, last time I've, I've okay, no, there are a few of them, but uh, I mean, okay, Task Force, Task Force 1942 has one, I think, to some extent, right. because I can play it for more than 10 minutes and not feel like you know, uh, uh, being uh, being against a computer, well, not too much, but uh, let's say that in the last 20 years, it has been hard to come by, uh, but 
uh, this I have high hopes in my AI. Uh, I've called it Tanaka. I mean, that's my Surface Combat AI. We nice. call it Tanaka. Uh, 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 and uh, the AI, the Air AI is called Jimmy for Jimmy Thatch. And, uh, and the yeah, the Surface Combat part is going to be developed as I mean. We, I, I don't have much to show, but people can be reassured that our objective is to emulate to the very least the experience you had for uh, with uh, fighting steel. To okay. the very minimum, the surface combat is going to be fighting steel level, which should be all right for a game that is centered on carriers, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. as, as to how it's going to be implemented, uh, I, I expect you to be able, you know, to place waypoints and to give some uh, some cues in regard of rules of engagement in that regard uh, of engagement it's not going to be too far off what uh, combat modern operation has for instance or harpoon have they're yeah. gonna if you you know these games you can actually set the set the set the route for the force and tell them what to do at every level but uh, it's going to be simpler than that because I think that uh, unlike Harpoon or CMO, we're not we are really working on just two services at a very specific time in in history. It's easier to do uh, to do specific stuff and make sure that you know destroyers attack like a destroyer division and stuff like that. I mean, right. uh, yeah, that's another thing also that uh, is not found in games since Fighting Steel. And maybe also, and of course, no, I mean, uh, in 3D, yeah, because all the games like the John Tiller naval campaigns or every uh, Steam and Iron and Rule Rule the Waves, they do they do have it. But 3D games, they don't have divisions. Uh, Ultimate Admiral uh, Dreadnought got divisions back in the in the topic, but uh, uh, divisions uh, they are one of the main conditions on which you're gonna have to base. Uh, your uh, your AI to begin with, because in real life it's not uh, uh, an eleven ship uh, an eleven ship task force is not eleven ships put together with no hierarchy. You've right. got divisions, and then you've got task groups, and then you've got task force. In fact, divisions being task units in the American system, and uh, and this opens you know new ways of seeing inter artificial intelligence because then you have it's like moving around small battalions it's not like moving around uh 300 guys and moving each guys on their uh, at the same level i mean well, it sounds a bit complicated like that but uh, i'm i'm confident that we're gonna make it look not too shabby no and yeah that all sounds great the ability to control i don't know just the visions in general and less micro like you're not controlling an individual cruiser it's the game's task force admiral not cruiser captain so i think i don't know i think uh you're you're setting expectations there which is good and i look forward to seeing how that shakes out um i am you have answered the majority of the questions i really wanted to ask at this point um i guess uh one thing i did want to ask like what was your inspiration for the graphical interface because overall i do like the I, I'm a huge fan of stylized graphic, you know, you know, interfaces of, you know, old, uh, a lot of games today go for the more clean and modern look, but, uh, it, you struck a pretty good balance, I think. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, the situation today makes it, uh, actually harder. Uh, to design a good GUI, I think, because you can do anything now. I mean, before that, you had to find a, a, a gimmick and then stick to it, and then it would be done. But then you have, you end up with uh, games out there like High Fleet. Um, oh, yeah. From Constantine. I mean, and, uh, I mean, it feels like, I mean, he, he can do that kind of stuff with, uh, you know, f uh, flying ships that don't even exist. Mm -hmm. What kind of person am I not to at least try to get some part of my uh, interface to be, uh, like they call it, I mean, uh, it's a word I, I learned when I was uh, doing the design. I mean, a diegetic uh, interface. And uh, 
uh, to me, it's a it's a classic of the genre. I mean, we had a lot of simulation. Uh, uh, the same way that you are in a cockpit in a simulation uh, in a game like all the Sonalist submarine games, you get a station, you get a console, you get a you you get the real stuff in front of you. So we needed to. I wanted to have some part of that, and at the same time, I didn't want it to be completely unreadable to the uh, to the player i mean it's not really a it's not a really a station simulator i mean it's not destroyer u-boat hunter i mean in destroyer u-boat hunter they have you actually use the sonar and they have you actually use all these instruments i mean in that case i just want these instruments to be um, um to be representative to serve as a background for the functions but i don't want you to learn how to actually calculate a heading or stuff like that because as you say it's uh, an admiral simulation it's not a navigation officer simulation and in that regard actually you know we're not that far off uh, a game like uh, like silent hunter i mean <laughs> silent hunter uh, is still super simple compared to a game like uh, wolf pack today or stuff like that oh, yeah. because they, they they don't tell you to actually turn the goddamn uh, to hit the goddamn button or to turn the the wheel to to make the ship dive i mean you give an order i mean uh, silent hunter i mean it's always been a, a big um, who say uh, <laughs> i mean silent hunter in summer games they always have been cheating because they are not simulations. I mean, okay, they are simulations. Like, my game is a simulation. They are command simulations. Right. So, okay, you get the gimmick of playing around with the deck gun or the AA gun, but actually you're always in command. Sometimes they let you draw a little line on the map, but <laughs> everything else is just a command. I mean, right. they are not actually telling you how you you drive. You're not driving a submarine. You're giving an order to get the, to the guy who drives a submarine. So, I mean, they we're gonna be a little bit like that, except that instead of giving the order to the guy who drives the uh, the the aircraft carrier, you give an order to the guy who drives the whole task force, if I may say. I mean, right. If there was a guy like that. Um. If there's any. More question, like any last minute questions anyone in the stage has, go ahead and, and shoot. Well, there I've seen stuff about like say uh, um, what kind of control you have on uh, all the allied uh, elements. Uh, I mean, there's something that we didn't cover too much. It's really the um, uh, scalability of what uh, of the user experience. Uh, really, you want we want the user to play that game the way he or she wants. Oh, well, I say she, I mean, it's like I'm uh, wishful thinking. I'm guessing, hey, you'd that, be uh, surprised. Uh, oh, yeah, I'd be surprised, <laughs> on, perhaps, but uh, like he or she wants to, to have, and um, that means that this game actually it really can be played in three different ways. I mean, this, I guess, we're gonna get the, the photo for that when we uh, when you're gonna make the video, but um. It's it's been thought so as to blur the lines between three I would call three different genre. I mean you've got the arcade RTS and then you get the classical RTS, I mean the classical strategy game or the the classical war game even. And then you have the enhanced experience war game experience that is specific to Task Force Admiral. Uh this can be achieved by simply, you know, opening or closing uh, doors when it comes to the flow of information, the communication, uh, what the players know. I mean, when I was, I never paid attention when I was very young. I found it very, you know, very natural that you get a, on a game like Pacific Air War or, or Task Force 1942, you, get, you send a plane on a search and then you can see the little plane flying on the on the map and then uh, yeah, it goes around and it comes back and it reports in real time and then when it gets shut down it tells you ah, i've been shut down i mean okay right. man cool except even cars out of war works like that except when you read john lundstrom you realize that it never happened like that yeah I you mean, don't you know literally... when your flight gets uh destroyed <laughs> you I mean, know like you know, the, the the you know nothing 
you if i'm john snow sorry but uh, uh uh they you absolutely know nothing you've got battles that never happened because uh, a japanese a seaplane crew was never in uh was never able to send a message before getting shot down yeah i mean if you yeah. take all these games and then your uh, your scooting planes get shot down and then you know it in immediately and then you can take a decision in real life these planes they would disappear and you wouldn't even know that they disappeared before they do a check so for uh, a radio check so for japanese flying boat it's all right they can communicate because nobody if I do, the existence of rubble is not a it's not a secret mm -hmm. but when you have a sbd uh when you have a dauntless uh, uh or uh scouting the moment he's gonna send a communication he's not only betraying his his position he's betraying the existence of uh, American task force in range. Right. So, point is that when you launch a search plane, if it doesn't come across something that is worthy of being reported, or if it's not sighted itself, it will never, never send you a report. So that means that uh, that means that uh, it will you will send them, you will see them disappear over the horizon. A little bit later, you're gonna see them disappear off your radar. And it's going to be over for the next two or three hours until they come back. And when they come back, well, there's one missing. You never know. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. You've got a replay function, so evidently sure. you're going to know. But you never know what happened uh, if he didn't send you a message. And that's and, something... Uh, it, well, you, you said yeah. um, with the replay function, I mean, that's something... Like, everything's still happening. Like, it's not... Your planes don't go off screen or off the map, and then it's just like you know, art basic RNG or whatever. It's an event. Like sure. uh, all of this stuff is still, I guess, modeled or simulated in the background, right? Yeah, I mean, we are. It's not. Uh, it's not Falcon Four. It only bubbles. I mean, uh, it's all. Uh, it's all right. I mean, we can have. 500 if I, we will have some sort of bubbles but the uh, fact is that all these planes they're still gonna exist on this uh, and actually at a lower level of realism and this is what i was coming to just earlier if you want to see everything all the time it's okay too if you even want to give orders without being penalized for that again receiving a penalty for that then you can do it too you just decide what kind of game uh, experience you want you do that before you start the scenario of course huh? but uh, i mean it's gonna be it's super different to play that game at the maximum level where you literally know nothing and you have to make assumption and at a classical rts level where you can send your scout out there just like you're sending your 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 zergling uh, to scout the map <laughs> and you right. see everything around your zergling. I mean, okay, if this is how you want to play it, you play it that way. Uh, it's fine with me. Thing is that I want to be uh, in this day and age. If you want to have a maximum of people playing your game, you have, you want to adapt to what they want to play, and not and people are not alike. Right. I mean, it's very much like. I mean, you have a long experience with uh, flight simulators. It's very much like when uh, in a flight simulator you decide if you want to be blinded by the sun or if you want to uh, have to, uh, to to have advanced engine management or if you have to want to have if you want to have illimited ammo. I mean, I want to give these people this option, and this is where the simulation part of the game comes uh, kicks in and is very useful. Yeah, and I think having that wide variety of realism settings a game is great personally i'm excited to not know what is going on at all <laughs> that is <laughs> i mean it's easier for people like us who grew up with these games you know when you i don't know if you uh, uh, how old you are now even though you sound very wise but uh, it's all uh, for... it's all a uh, i'm just acting it's exactly. all an act <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh yeah i mean what we had a double evolution uh, in the 90s. We had, uh, I mean, if you are of my generation, you had games that evolved and we had 
and we as people we evolved at the same time it was not really linear uh i mean game ga- games that would pass a super hardcore back in the 90s i mean they especially combat simulations when you compare them today to a dcs level study uh, study sim they will feel like you know toys even though back in the day they were super complicated i mean falcon 3 tornado even fleet defender i mean uh, okay today you have the new head blur of uh, tomcat it feels like fleet defender was well, was really really simplified, but back in yeah. the day, people were like, "Oh, I never come across such a completed game, complicated game." And then you had our own evolution. I mean, I was playing from uh, the age of eight uh, with games like Their Finest Hour, Silent Service Two, mm-hmm. to today, and then uh, yeah, along the way, I haven't been playing with all the realism options on at all times i remember that when i started playing longbow 2 i was 14 or something no maybe 13 14 or something i mean the 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 game manual was in french which was good because all the game manuals they used to not to be translated but i mean this one was in french and uh but even then i mean it was three four hundred uh, hundred pages uh i didn't even have a, a real joystick until a certain time and I was like, I would switch off all the realism options. I think I couldn't even crash on Longbow 2. I mean, people would, today, they would tell you, I mean, you're playing that game on that level of... You're playing DCS uh, without the option of crashing. You are not worthy of playing DCS. Well, okay, fine. But uh, uh, I mean, you, I have to take into account that I want to, to, to have people like myself when I was 12 or when I was 8 enjoy my game at a level that is um, understandable, uh, appreciable, uh, enjoyable right. for them. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if they don't enjoy themselves, they're not going to come back to it. And it's going to be not just a loss for our game, it's going to be a loss for the genre too, because I don't have the feeling that what we are doing right now it's going to be reproduced anytime soon because the community is just too small. So, I mean, we are niche. Well, yeah, I mean, thinking back, like, of course, we got, I mean, there's been a recent influx of naval games, which has been extremely exciting. But, I mean, the past decade, it's been, I mean, really nothing. Um, So, yeah, I think the more the merrier and the more people uh, y'all can get into it, uh, the better as well. I think the genre is in, I think the genre has a pretty bright future, which is something I wouldn't have said probably 10 years ago. I was not very optimistic. <laughs> I I did I did have more questions that were more nitty gritty like um like gameplay aspects, but maybe that's something we can do in a uh, a follow up interview because we are reaching our over our time here. But yeah, this yeah, was uh oh go ahead. Uh, yeah, just uh, wanted to say hi to Cotanius in the in the in the chat right now. I mean. Uh, Hi, Cotanius. I mean, he's he's actually the dev for a, a smart little game that you might want to try if you haven't just yet. I mean, he's doing um, a bomber crew kind of game that is named Boat Crew. You might have, yeah. And uh, I mean, uh, it's getting better and better. I mean, uh, he's doing it all all by himself. But I've seen a lot of the research that goes in this game, and uh, I mean. And that that will be the kind of game that has its place on your channel. I mean, at a time where he deems to his game to be ready, of course, it's in early access right now. But I mean, um, just saying hi. Oh, very cool. Sweet, yeah. I will check that out for sure, and I'm sure multiple people in the stage are checking it out now too. But yeah, this has been like a pretty good interview. This was my first. Uh... First time doing anything like this, so hopefully you thought it went smoothly as well. I think it went pretty uh, good. Happy to be your first. Oh your yeah. Worries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I I'm glad to have uh have you as my uh first interviewee as well. I think this was awesome. So I got uh a good amount of the questions through. Like I said, I had 
maybe another time we can do another when we uh and get more into more nitty gritty gameplay stuff but i think we answered a lot of the overreaching questions people would have about task force admiral so of course I mean, uh, happy to do it again uh, whenever we have something new to show, and hopefully it's going to be soon. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Well, folks, that will do it for today's interview. I do hope you all enjoyed it. Like I said, this was my first time doing anything like this, so I did come off a bit awkward, but uh, I'm sure that will be something that only improves as I do this more. Anyway, if you liked the video, please be sure to leave a like and comment, as it really does help out the channel. But until next time, this is Wolfpack345 signing off, and I will see you all on the next one.